Hey everyone, this is Tyson at Titans of CNC. Today I'm going to be walking you through my very first part on the SMX 2100. Now this part is a fill drain and it's based on an actual part that we used to do for another aerospace company. I can't say the name, but let's say that it's a company that's called like Space A, Space B, something like that. It's based on a part that we used to do. We actually have the piece still in the shop, but I took it, I made it bigger. I removed a few features and I basically changed it up to the point where hopefully I won't get in trouble for showing this. So please don't sue me. No, don't sue me. That's the opposite of the point that I'm trying to make. Now the original part was made out of steel. I'm gonna be making this one out of titanium. But the only thing with the titanium is that I have to run it with coolant. And once you turn on coolant, you can't see anything that's happening on the part, especially when the high pressure system is kicking on that machine. So I asked our film crew here if they could also film the aluminum setup piece that I'm gonna be running to prove out my program and make sure everything's dialed in on the new machine. So that way you can have some footage of the part running dry. And then once the coolant's on, just Please trust me that that's titanium running and it's doing a very similar pass. But for the setup piece, I basically run it at the same depth of cuts, the same program. Everything's the same. I just crank up the speeds and feeds on the machine using the override controls. So I usually crank them up 40-50% just to get it going on the aluminum. While the titanium one runs, of course, at your slower speed that you would normally run titanium at. So I'm pretty excited about this part. I'm running it on a brand new machine. I've got some new tools in it. So let's jump into this. I'm in the programming room. I brought my orbital computer in here. So loaded up my program. If you're in the market for a really good computer that can do master cam, solid work, loading up crazy five axis, nine axis toolpaths, make sure you check these guys out because they specialize in CAD and CAM computers. Barry recently got an upgraded computer because he was having some trouble running that gas monkey grill. If you haven't seen that video, check it out. It's a really cool one. And after that upgrade, it was able to run that toolpath lightning fast. So they're worth checking out if you need a new programming computer. So I got my part up in Mastercam. I also have SolidWorks loaded up. I drew the whole part and designed it in SolidWorks. This will be a complete part on the SMX 2100. We're gonna do a chuck transfer. So we have both ops on both chucks. For the first operation, we're gonna be doing all of the work on the side that has this big bore in the center. We'll do as much as we can. We'll do the hex on the outside. And for the second op, we'll be taking care of all the milling work on the face of the part and bringing it to size. Now, honestly, I could probably do like the hex on the second side after all the lathe work is done. And that will be easier on the lathe tool because it wouldn't be doing an interrupted cut. But I didn't want to worry about any clearances and honestly, it would work either way. So I'm going to be doing the hex side on the first operation and we'll just be finishing up by turning the rest of it on the second side. So the first tool, I have a CNMG 432, 32 thousandths radius. We're gonna be using it to rough out the OD and face the part. I'm gonna be using Kenna Metal's KCU-10B Ken Gold inserts. These are inserts that specialize in a wide variety of materials, and it's actually perfect for a job like this where I'm gonna be running a setup piece and a titanium piece, so I don't have to use two different kinds of inserts or you know worry about one insert not really being for aluminum and then running the titanium. So perfect for a job like this. And they're really good inserts for cutting super alloys, titanium, stainless steels, pretty much anything you throw at it. So I've been pretty happy using them. For the titanium piece, I'm gonna be running it at 220 SFM with a feed rate of 11 thousandths per revolution. And that's taking a depth of cut of 110 thousandths on the OD and for the face, I'm just going in until I get a nice clean cut, which was about 30 or 40 thousandths off the front of the part. And like I mentioned before, on the aluminum piece, I'm running things a little bit faster. So I crank up the SFM about 50% and crank up the uh, feed rate about 10%. So just a little bit faster on the aluminum piece, but I still wanna see what my toolpath's doing because I am proving out the program. So for the OD and face pass, I'm roughing out the OD first, and then after the OD's roughed, I come in and face the part. And that's to get the diameter down. I don't have to worry about it for this piece because it's six and a half inches diameter, but I like to get in the habit when I'm using the upper turret to just 
bring down the OD as much as I can before I go across on the face. And that helps with clearances, especially when you start getting into the bigger parts. You can't really go down all the way and you have to, or you have to watch for bigger diameter stuff. So we're gonna bring down the OD first, then we're gonna face across it and just until it cleans up on material, I made sure by moving it in about 40 thousandths, I knew that's enough to where I would have a nice clean face. So after that, we have the big two inch diameter drill coming in from the upper spindle and that's using one of Kenna Metal's Drill Fix Pros. Now, I was a little nervous running this on titanium because I'm basically taking that big two inch drill all the way to the maximum depth of six inches deep. At least the drill that I'm using, which is a three times D drill. So the max depth on the drill was six inches and I'm taking it all the way there. So I needed to make sure the chip evacuation on that drill was perfect because by the time that drill starts reaching the later depths, once it gets in four, five, and then six inches deep, there's not a lot of room for those chips to flow out other than the flutes on the drill. So using the high pressure coolant was key along with making sure that my speeds and feeds were good so that I had a nice short chip coming off of that drill. That's also why I mounted that drill up in the upper spindle was so that I could utilize the high pressure coolant. I'm using the KCMS 40 inserts on both the inbore and outbore inserts on the drill along with the MS chip breaker on both inserts. I'm also running it at 450 RPM, which puts it at about 262 SFM with a feed rate of 3 thousandths, two tenths per revolution. So I was really happy with the way that drill ran. I was a little nervous running the titanium piece. I went through it fine, really happy with how it ran. After that, we have an OD Groover, which runs on the bottom turret. And that's on this groove on the outside of the part. And this tool is gonna rough and finish the groove. I'm also using a KCU-10B insert, same grade as the roughing insert. And that's running at 240 SFM with a feed rate of 5 thousandths per revolution. I leave a little bit on the roughing pass and then come in to finish it with the same tool. And I slow things a little bit down on the finished pass. So I'm running it at 200 SFM with a feed rate of 3 thousandths per revolution for the finish. After the groove, we're gonna rough out the inside ID of the part. Now I need to use a boring bar to rough out the material. Now one thing with the design of this part, which is also in the original part I based it on, is that on the inside of the part, you have a chamfer that goes into an undercut. So you need a tool that can go deeper into the part and basically step down past a certain distance. So that's why I'm using a DNMG, so I can undercut with that tool. Now for that tool, I'm running it at 180 SFM with a feed rate of 9 thousandths. Now that tool is still using the KCU-10B inserts, but I had to run things a little bit slower because that boring bar is sticking out so far and it's a steel boring bar. So I went with 180 SFM with a feed rate of 9 thousandths per revolution. And for the depth of cut, we're going 80 thousandths deep. And then that comes in, that roughs it all out, roughs out the front, and then undercuts in and gets as much as it can in that angle. We're actually going to finish this off on another operation, so it's not quite perfect there. So after we rough out the inside, we have our finish passes. And I actually split up the finish passes into two different ones. The first one is going to be using a heavy metal bar with a CPGT insert. Now it's a heavy metal boring bar, it doesn't just sound cool. It's a boring bar that's chatter resistant because of how heavy it is. It basically dampers any vibration in it. So I love using it when I can. We've had that bar in the shop for a while now. So I've used it a long time ago. I wanted to bring it back for this job. So for that boring bar, I'm coming down across the front portion of the ID. And then I actually come all the way down to the face and then go down across the wall. I actually stop a little bit further past where the center hole is gonna be on the second op. And that's because, if you see here, I don't have a whole lot of clearance. <laughs> I wanted to use a big boring bar, but I also had to avoid hitting the other side of the ID. So I calculated it out. I actually have the model of that tool in Mastercam, so just enough clearance to where I don't have to avoid hitting the other side of the part, but we come down further enough to where there's gonna be a step at the bottom of the part, but when I drill from the other side, that step gets removed. 
The other tool I'm using to finish is a DPGT boring bar. It's a similar shape, diamond shaped insert as the GNMG boring bar I used earlier, but it's a smaller one and it's at a different angle than the rougher. This lets me reach into the undercut that the rougher couldn't reach into and I can use it to also finish the part. So I do a quick roughing pass with that tool. 40 thousandths depth of cut, small depth of cut, but it's a small insert and a small area it's cutting. 220 SFM, feed rate of 5 thousandths per revolution. And then for that tool, it's basically wrapping into the center bore where there's no material anymore. For the lead in and lead out, I had to have those set so that it knew to feed in a certain direction and then feed out in a certain direction. So for the lead in, I have it going straight up and then for the lead out, it's coming out at an angle. And then I also adjust the chain and shortened it up on Mastercam. So it's not cutting into any of the portions that have already been finished by the previous tool. The only thing with those two tools is because I have two different boring bars running the ID. I need to make sure that they didn't have any steps where basically one ended and one started. So those tools needed to be dialed in, pretty much matched in Z perfectly. Thankfully, it's a brand new machine, so I don't have to adjust any of that. But that's something that you run into a lot when you're using multiple tools. So I used to do it all the time running aerospace work. You have to run some of the angle tools a little bit slower or they're not as rigid as the CNMGs were. So sometimes I only do like a little portion with a VNMG or DNMG. So you had to make sure that those tools all matched up in Z with whatever other operations you had, or you isolated it in your program so that only that tool did that section and you wouldn't have any steps. Had to make sure that that tool was dialed in. And then after that, we had our OD finish passes. Same kind of CNMG, smaller radius as the first tool. So I'm using a CNMG 431, KCU-10B insert still, and that one is facing the front of the part. And then it turns across the OD and across where the hex is going. Running it at 220 SFM, very similar to the roughing pass, but then I slowed the feed rate down so it's two and a half thousandths per revolution to get a nicer finish. So after all the lathe work was completed on the first side, now we're gonna make the hex on the OD of the part. For that, I'm using a Dodeca Mini to do some facing passes across where the hex is going. I've got a two and a half inch diameter tool. I'm going to be using it to rough and finish the hex. And that's using one of the super positive inserts to help get us a nicer finish on the part. I'm going to be running it at 210 SFM with a feed rate of 3 thousandths per tooth. And that puts us at about seven inches per minute. For the finish pass, we're going to kick up the SFM to 250 but then drop the feed rate down to two and a half thousandths, which will be taking about 10 thousandths off the roughing pass. And then that tool, just come across where all the lathe work has been done. I've got a stock model there to make sure that my tool wasn't going too deep. So I used the stock model on Mastercam to, to show where all my lathe work was done. And then that way, when I'm simulating it, I can make sure that I'm not going too deep on the side of the tool. And then of course, I did the rough pass, I did the finish pass, and then I transformed toolpath all the way around the part and told it to duplicate it five times at a 60 degree angle around the part. So I did it six times around the whole part and ended up working out great. So after the finish operation, we have our chuck transfer and Mastercam makes it pretty easy to have the chuck transfer set up. We basically select a pickoff operation, tell it where we want to position our turrets. It'll park the turrets over to the left and then it, uh, it'll sink everything. It'll unclamp, move the right spindle over and then clamp and unclamp the other spindle. We have all of our pickoff operations already on our uh, tool paths. The only thing is when I post it, I have to remember what order everything happens in because I have to tell the machine to wait at certain points. So I have to tell the lower turret to wait for the upper spindle and because the upper spindle is also associated with the left side chuck, the lower turret is associated with the right side chuck. You know, they all have a certain order that everything has to go. So you have sync points you set up when you post. One thing that I really like about the 2100 is that it seems like even without having any extra adapter plates or anything, I'm able to get these chucks really close. So I'm able to do chuck transfers without having super long parts like the 3100. So having it grab a part like this was no issue. I, 
I really had plenty of room to maneuver once both turret and the upper spindle were out of the way. After the chuck transfer and after the right side of the machine has the part, we then set our G55 work offset, which is set to the overall length of the part. That also tells us how much excess stock we have on the front of the part. And I wanna make sure that that matches up with Mastercam and that I have an accurate representation of how much front face stock I have on the part. So the first tool on the second side is basically a repeat of the first operation. I'm gonna rough out the OD and then I'm going to face the part using a CNMG 432 KCU 10B insert. Once again, I'm going to rough the OD out first, and then I'm going to face the part after the OD has been roughed out. I'm going to run it a little bit slower at 180 SFM with a feed rate of 9,000 per revolution, and I'm also going to drop the depth of cut just a little bit. And that's because I have an interrupted cut now with the hex around the OD of the part. So we're going to rough out the OD. It goes into the hex and then comes all the way down across the top of the part. And then we have our face passes on the front. Doing it this way, you don't have to worry as much about clearances, and also, you're putting more pressure towards the chuck when you're turning across the OD, and then as little as possible facing down the center. I think it would be fine either way, but it's a little more comfortable doing it this way. And one other thing is, if you've seen my other videos on programming the SMX3100, is that I'm using the exact same tool as the first operation. The only difference is in the tool angle, I have it flipped. So the tool in the upper spindle will flip to the other side and I'm able to use this tool on the right spindle now. The next operation is a quarter inch SGL drill and that's going straight in the center of the part. So I mentioned in the first operation, I wasn't going all the way to center line with the heavy metal boring bar when it was going down the face on the inside ID. And that's because on this operation, I'm using that quarter inch tool to go through the center of the part. So it's going about 500 thousandths deep. For this tool, I'm running it at 140 SFM, which puts it at about 2,100 RPM. And that's gonna be running at 4.3 inches per minute. It seems a little slow, but it is titanium. It is a small tool and it's not really cutting that much. We're just going through half an inch of material. One thing I wanted to make sure though, is that I had tip compensation turned off and that's gonna make sure that the drill goes past where the angle of the drill is. So it's gonna go a little bit further to make sure that I'm not cutting it short. But that's just an easy way of doing it, just clicking the tip compensation box. So the next tool we have is a 5 8 SGL drill. And that's also going to be running on the face of the part, but this one is going through the three pockets that we have on the front. And that's going to take off quite a bit of material and give us a starting point for our end mill when we run our mill operation. So for that one, I actually drew a wireframe on the front of the part with three points, and those are the starting points that I want for this drill. And that was so I could be absolutely sure for the position of this drill, since it's a little bit of a tight fit inside of these pockets, and I wanted to make sure everything was perfect. This one I'm also running at 140 SFM, but because it's a bigger diameter tool, the RPM is going to be a lot slower. So this one's running at 855 RPM. The feed rate I'm running a little bit faster than the smaller drill, but it still only puts it at about 3.3 inches per minute. But again, I'm not really cutting too much with this drill. It's just going in about 500 thousandths deep. And once again, I have tip compensation turned on on this drill so that we make sure that we go past the tip of the drill. Once that operation finished, I then created a stock model in Mastercam, and that has our drilled holes in it. And now with the stock model, Mastercam knows where those holes are. We can plunge into those holes and start our roughing pass. So that brings us to our roughing operation, which is a 3D high-speed dynamic pass. For this one, I'm using the brand new Harvey 4 in mill, and I've heard from Barry and Jesse that it's a pretty good tool to use. So it's gonna be the first time I'm using the tool, and I'm gonna be trying it in titanium. It's an eight flute end mill, and I've heard that it's a really good tool to use for both roughing and finishing operations. And I wasn't really sure where to run it, and the speeds when I looked it up seemed a little bit too slow, so I asked my dad for some advice. I've never really ran milling tools in titanium this fast, but he told me to crank up the speed to 300 SFM with a feed rate of two and a half thousandths per tooth, which puts it at about 61 inches per minute, 
which is about 10 times faster than what I was planning on running it at. So it was a little scary running that tool. But you know what? It cut it no problem, and it was awesome murdering material like that. This tool is a 3 8 end mill with eight flutes in it, and I'm running it at 300 SFM with a feed rate of 61 inches per minute, which puts it at two and a half thousandths per tooth. But I am running the tool with a 5% step over. So it's a small step over, but this thing is gonna be moving fast. It's gonna murder that titanium. Now with this tool path, because it's a 3D tool path, I'm able to use rest material on it. So for the stock options, I made sure to select our stock model that I just created with the drilled holes in the front. And what that does is you can see from my rapid moves here, and if I turn on the stock model, we have our end mill just cruising into those drilled holes. So it knows to start there and then start the roughing pass there. I don't need to helical down in it, so we can just plunge the end mill down in there and go to town. The other parameter that I made sure to turn on was I, I told it a maximum depth of 5 eighths, just bring the tool all the way down. I cranked up my step down so I only had one basically full depth on the tool, no step ups, just full send down into those holes and start roughing. And then using that same tool, we're going to finish the profile of each of these pockets. I have a waterline pass using the same tool, which is basically a contour around each of these pockets. And once again, I'm using 300 SFM, but I dropped the feed rate down to 1 thousandths per tooth, which is 25 inches per minute, just to get a nice surface finish around these pockets. Once again, that's a lot faster than what I originally programmed that, so I'm glad I came to my dad for some advice. After the hard part, we have a 3 8 ball nose dual lock that I'm using, a Harvey, and I'm gonna be using that to deburr the front of the pocket. So for that toolpath, I ended up using the deburr option in the multi-axis toolpath. I'm running this toolpath at 300 SFM with a feed rate of 15 inches per minute. It's going a little bit fast, but we're not gonna be taking too much material off. I'm just putting a 20 thousandths edge break on the part. I just had to make sure that the angle the tool was coming in was right especially on the nine axis. So this tool comes in at an angle, uses the ball nose to put an edge break around the front of the part and worked out perfect. And then after that, we have our last tool, which is a finish path using a CNMG 431, just like the first stop, just flipping the tool 180 degrees. And now I'm able to use it on the right spindle. So once again, similar as the first operation, 220 SFM, feed rate of two and a half thousandths. That'll give us a nice surface finish across the OD of the part and bring us to our overall length. And that's all the operations for the fill drain. It was a lot of fun making the part, especially running it on a brand new machine, a part that I used to do way back in the day. So recreating that and what better way to start a new machine off than running some titanium. I really liked running the Harvey four. That was cool. It's a shame that lathe tools don't have eight flutes on them. So it's kind of a, you have the Harvey 4 running at 60 inches per minute while the other ones are running at 6 to 10 inches per minute. So it was really cool running something that fast in titanium. If you're interested in any of those tools that I used on this part, the Harvey 4, the Ken Gold inserts, the Dodeca Mini, and you can buy any of these tools from us at titansofcnctooling.com. It sounds like a little bit of a commercial, but if you're gonna be buying tools anyway, what better way to buy tools than to fund free education while doing so? Check out our store and remember to like, comment, and subscribe to this video. And we're gonna have more content coming for the 2100. I'm actually really excited because I'm getting something really big for that machine. So make sure you hit that notification bell and I'll see you in the next video.